Um, Granny, did, did you want us to download Quitch? Yeah, that would be great. Because that way you can get the student experience and so on. And then I thought I'd give everybody a bit of a background and how it all came about mm. and then run everyone through the educator portal. So by the end of the session, you'll have seen both sides of it. Yep. Yeah, if you make some decisions and so on. Because I had trouble downloading it for some reason. Uh, it, oh, did you? Yeah, it said the app is no longer available on the App Store. Uh, if you can yes. see that. Well, it's very strange. I've been using it all morning. Hmm. I just downloaded it about 15 minutes ago, so it seemed okay. Maybe it's an old version I've got. And it's trying yeah, to reinstall it. Called, yeah. Of course, um, if you've got an iPhone, it's just been updated to iOS 14. So. Ah, yes. It does sound some, like something from Harry Potter. <laughs> yes, Tom, quite a few people have said that. So actually, the name came about a colleague at Swinburne actually suggested it's an old English word for gift or present. So I thought, okay, we were, I was spending ages trying to come up with a name. I thought, okay, that sounds great. That will do. <laughs> so that's how it came about. Although my students tell me it's actually something else. But however, I'm going to stick with my story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it worked. It was an old version. Okay, great. I was going to say, Paul, whoops, what's happened there? Yeah, so we go if everyone downloaded just while we're waiting for some of the others to join us. Tom seems to be popping, popping in and out there. Uh, must be his uh, famous Wi-Fi connection. Hmm. I'm going to have to go and see if I can find my password that I wrote down somewhere. So what's the um, idea of the screen name? It's a bit like an avatar, is it, um, Cornia? Yes, it is. So we had some feedback comes from some of the students that um, if they weren't performing so well, they were feeling a bit intimidated and so on. So they didn't want you know, to be identified, especially the girls, I must say. The guys weren't so bothered by being identified. Um, so what we did was therefore create a screen name. So their peers don't know who they are, unless of course you want to share that. But you as the educator will always know because you have access to the portal, which gives their, oh, okay. their student email and so on. So it just allows them to have, you know, a little bit more fun. And as they said, feeling safe that um, they can practice and so on as often as they like. So I'm currently an emerald platypus, but I might change that. Oh, diamond goat. Hmm. <laughs> no, kiwis. no kiwis available. Yeah. <laughs> Grey shark. Oh, that sounds better. Might go with that. <clears throat> well, I think we might as well um, get underway, Gronia. Um, okay. Usually, if people were joining us early, they would have joined us by now. Um, okay. So, I might get Paul to do a little bit of an intro, sure. um, if that's okay, Paul. Yeah, is your um, bio up to date, Grania? Um, probably. <laughs> right, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Grania Oates, an Associate Professor in Accounting at Swinburne University of Technology. Uh, Grania specialises in teaching introductory and management accounting at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Her primary research interests are in learning and teaching, with a special focus on teaching innovations to enhance the student experience and learning outcomes. She's the founder and CEO of Quitch, a content neutral gamified mobile learning platform built to enhance the student experience. The platform is now in use in educational institutions, professional associations and corporates across the world. So welcome Gronia to the Escalite uh, Mobile Learning Special Interest Group, or at least uh, the few of us that are currently online live and uh, to those who will be watching it uh, asynchronously later. So. Yeah, tell us about Quitch. Great, thank you so much, Thomas and Paul, for the um, introduction. So I thought um, what I might do is, yeah, give me give you some background on how Quitch came about and so on. As Paul said, I'm an academic at Swinburne. So I've 
prepared a few PowerPoint slides because I thought that might be helpful for some people to have a look at later. And then I thought we could jump into the educator portal and I can give you a demonstration of how one would set it up, invite learners, and then show, step you through the analytics as well. How does that sound like for a plan? Sounds good. Okay. And do I have the ability to share? Oh, let me make you co-host. Here we go. You now have the power. Thank you. So as all of our meetings start off these days, can everybody see that screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. It's unfortunate how Zoom doesn't give you a preview as a presenter, isn't it? Yeah, it is actually, but it, yeah, it does not indeed. So, um, so I'll go and probably start at the beginning. And so I'm an academic, as I said, at um, Swinburne University, and I teach first year accounting, which probably as all of you know, can be an issue um, the world over in terms of high failure rates and, and low retention. And so I was essentially looking for a way to engage the students outside of the classroom. I tried a number of different things in the classroom because somebody was retiring, the dean had asked me to take the unit over and see if I could come up with some innovative ways to um, help educate the students. So I was watching them leave the theater one day and all 500 were attached to their mobile device. So it struck me that whatever solution I came up with, it had to be mobile first. So I did some research around gamification and mobile solutions and so on, and then ran some ideas past the students. And um, they, were, they said that they would actually help me to co-create this, um, this product. So it has actually been built with students and with other academics. So the idea was when we were building that solution that we had both sets of stakeholders involved from, from the outset. So it's mobile first, it is gamified, and it gives immediate feedback and so on, which I'll, which I'll step you through. So we make learning fun and engaging. So that was the first thing the students had said that they wanted to the experience actually be an enjoyable experience. And I thought I couldn't really argue with that. I really wanted the student voice and the solution. So they were very much um, um, focused on being able to enjoy the experience at the moment. What I was doing was, was not really working for them. Also then I focused on yet being a positive experience and really empowering them. So they get immediate feedback on their mobile device highlighting for them the areas in red, those topics that they're struggling with and need to focus more on. It's like a traffic light system. And then also, of course, in terms of give, giving them that immediate feedback, they have kind of a number of attempts to get questions right. And it tells them what their accuracy level is, what their activity level is, how they're doing compared to their colleagues, what their class average is, and so on. It's um, started off in universities, but it has since now moved into professional associations like CPA and FPA, and also some corporate. So again, the idea allowing those students going for the CPA program or the FPA program to allow them to practice and with the idea being that they have a better, better learning outcome, if you like. And we have peer reviewed published research and um, to show the positive impacts and learning outcomes. And I don't know if any of you are at Otega University, but some people there did an independent study from us as well. So it is a borderless digital innovation and it has well, what we refer to as superior analytics, and that's the feedback um, we've got on the product. We now have a team here in Melbourne in terms of the development is all done um, on site. And also we've got obviously some support people in terms of UI and business development. We have advisors, so we get advice from OGs from Calendly and Atlassian in terms of the technology and our roadmap, and then some other people in terms of the business and um, commercials. So the problem really that I identified at the outset when I talked to both the students and the educators was this lack of learner engagement. I certainly, I don't know about you, but I certainly had an issue with that. And while it started in accounting, it very, very quickly became obvious that this was also an issue in many other disciplines as well. So Quitch was built as a content neutral platform. So it can be used across engineering, sciences, and so on as well. You simply pour your own content into the platform. We had low visibility on the learner performance. So from our point, our point of view as educators, there was two areas of performance we wanted to focus on. The performance of an individual student, meaning that I wanted to be able to reach out in real time to those who were at risk, because we know the earlier we intervene, the much greater chance of success we have. So what I do now is I can identify through the platform who are those who are at risk. And I identify that by they've attempted 
the questions and material delivered, but they've got less than 50%. So it allows me to intervene early and support them. I also then have the option to identify those who are what I consider to be completely disengaged. They're not actually, they've went to the bother of downloading and enrolling, but they haven't really answered hardly any of the questions at all, or, or perhaps maybe none. So again, different messaging that I want to send to that group. And then we had also had the delayed data and insights. So I wanted to know in terms of the performance of my content, what were the areas in real time that students were struggling with? So I wanted to be able to, again, dynamically change my lesson plan. So I actually found, as, as did others, some of our colleagues at Monash were saying the same thing, that they actually found that very quickly they were discovered they were focusing perhaps too much on some of those introdu introductory topics and not anywhere near enough on those areas that some of their students were struggling with. So I have much improved um, performance rates as a result of, of this. The students themselves then they talked about that they wanted the uh, learning tool to be accessible to them 24 seven at a time of their choosing. They wanted it to be interactive and something they could engage with because they talked about getting distracted by playing games on their mobile phones. So I thought we could actually fix that if we take what's currently distracting them, those elements of gamification and use it, um, and use it in the learning process. They wanted to get immediate actionable feedback and not wait until they went back into class. And then they also want to get a personalized learning journey. So identifying for them where their areas of difficulty are. The solution then, so the solution was built all around improving the performance. And that was done through then educating the students, engaging them with the content, reporting back to them. So the students talked about wanting those data points for themselves as much as we want to them for the whole group. So reporting back to them. And then obviously the content is, um, in some cases has been co-created more recently with academics. So a student and academic co-creation, which is working really well, I must say. And then obviously the um, idea is that it's an engaging, positive experience, empowering and indeed, indeed fun. So um, in terms of what you will experience if you were to use it, we've got that real time data on the learner performance. It's very easy to set up and then we disseminate that content, the ideas in bite sized chunks, because this is what, again, students told us works for them. They'll have a motivating way to learn and they engage very well with it the ability to learn anytime and anywhere, and then these, again, this personalized um, feedback. In terms of um, giving you feedback and some of the people who have been using it, so Maddie at the University of Melbourne has been using it now for probably two or three years in terms of with his, um, with his engineering students and having great engagement and uh, he's really happy and continues to use it. Uh, some of you might know Phil over at UWA, Phil used with them um, MBA students. So Phil had an incredible 90% level of engagement on day two of the course and it never dropped off. Phil said he was not at all surprised by this though because he said MBA students are, they're extremely busy. He said they said any opportunity they get to learn while they're traveling and so on, anything that's convenient to them like that. Also he said they're very, very competitive. So it, it worked very well for them. Um, CPA then in terms, Jessica ran the program there. So she found that um, the post pilot survey showed that 78% of the students said it helped them to perform better. And in terms of the outcome, CPA had a 10.11% higher result for in the exam for those students who used it versus those who, not, who didn't. So it's always an opt in I should, um, should say as well. And then just to give you an idea of um, some of the people that are using it, we've got UTS, Sydney, University of Melbourne, Swinburne, and some others there. We have a technology roadmap that we're working on. We can talk about that perhaps a little later. And then I've just got a couple of um, summary slides here in terms of um, where we're going with the product. So I might stop at this point and see if you have any questions before I um, jump into the demo. And hopefully I didn't talk too fast. <laughs> Great, thank you, Kwani. Um, I'm sure there's some questions. So. Grant, do you have any uh, computer science uh, academics using it? Uh, yes, I do. And yes. how, how do they use it? How do they use it? Yeah, in terms just of, curious. Yeah, so they use it in terms of they upload some various resources and then they've aligned it essentially with their week-by-week -week course. Where, so the idea is it's around that consolidation reinforcement of the primary learning, not about replacing that. So they've aligned it with the course, so they push questions and resources out to the students following delivery of the lecture to get an understanding of where their learning is. So that's just a very new customer. Hmm. Just, just start with computer science, but yes, 
it is being used there for yeah so the the delivery and interaction is mobile first what about the uh, creation of the content and the uh, activities is that done on mobile or do you have to use a, a um, you know a desktop or laptop to yeah that's do desktop it? for adding that we thought it would be we thought it would be too fiddly um, and that's what i'll step you through next if you like and um, so that's all done from your desktop so from the learner's perspective they just download the app and that's what's accessible to them and then from the educator's perspective they have a web-based portal so the the groups that are co-creating then the students are using a uh, uh, the, some sort of content creation software on there uh, no so in that case the the academic so they actually set up access to the student for the portal in that sense as well so that's the, con the content creation is web-based yes it is exactly yeah yeah has anyone actually used quitch yeah good in question. this this group here I, I tested it when I was at Swinburne many years ago. Mm. Had anybody heard of it out of interest? Obviously, I know Paul and Paul did. No? Okay. No, no. Yeah. Um, so, so, Chris, you weren't aware of it being used at uh, Melbourne? I wasn't, but as soon as Granny started describing what it did, I saw the potential applications. Some of what I'm doing right now is working with large introductory uh, mm. subjects that uh, are experiencing some of the stressors that you're describing, especially around feedback and uh, you know learners own interaction with diagnostics. And I can definitely see some of the potential. Yeah, that's a, a really good point, but because this is one of the really big um, issues and it works very well in those large first year units. It's been a real yeah. focus, Chris, so you're exactly right, yeah. especially from the students' perspective. As you know, we all know that, you know, the, how many of them drop out, 25% we lose in the first, you know, few weeks and so on. But my thing was if we could intervene early and support those students, especially when we have those large groups mm -hmm. where they often get lost and then we, you know, run additional workshops or whatever that might be. But yeah, it makes a huge difference in terms of, you know, that level of support for them early on. And how is it working uh, in remote mode? Uh, you know, currently, um, is there a difference between how it was perhaps working face to face in a lecture compared to, you know? Yeah, it was actually always designed, Thomas, to actually be used by students outside of the classroom. Okay. So the idea was that they would come along to their lecture tutorial and we would actually push out to their mobile device following that once they left actually some questions directly related to what they just did. So it wasn't about, you know, it's about that consolidation reinforcement of that primary learning. So it was always designed for outside of the classroom to kind of keep things front of mind. So right. in this so rather than being uh, interaction inside a, a lecture setting, it's, it's for more sort of the informal learning outside of that. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So it's around that formative assessment. And yeah, some people did use it in classes sometimes in tutorials and so on, they would just set up some questions to be pushed out. I never used it in class. I had always the idea was to use it outside and just keep that engagement going. Can I ask a question about the learning analytics aspect of it? Have you gotten any feedback from the students on uh, how they interact with that kind of personalized learning analytics or to what degree they find that an important part yeah, actually, it's a huge part of it for them. It was one of the um, one of the things they had asked for in the very first instance because I was explaining to them about the analytics that I collect as the academic, and they were saying, "Well, why can't we have analytics as well?" And I thought, actually, that's there's no reason you can't. I thought that's a great idea. So they they talked about, you know, it would be really good if I could just look at the app and it identify me where my areas of difficulty are. So we have this kind of traffic light system, Chris, that you it highlights in red for you, for example, tells you to zone in on this area because you haven't done so well in that area and things like that. So then the more recent focus group, what they wanted, they wanted then some more analytics around activity levels and how they're doing compared to what the points are for some of the people around them on the leaderboard and so on. So you'll see if you go to the leaderboard at the bottom, you'll be able to click on that tab and there's an arrow and gives you your activity level. Also, they wanted also to know once they'd mastered a skill. 
So now we've got mastery of various topics and so on. So a number of additional elements that, that so we're up to version four now, but we work with the student each semester because there's always something new that they come up with and so on. They also wanted things like, you know, what was my last winning streak? Because they talked about that being helping them to stay engaged and so on. So a lot around that personal analytics. And I'm sure there's more we can do in that area as well. So it'd be great to pick your brain on that maybe at some point. And what's the cost? Um model uh, so, yeah so the cost is seven dollars fifty per student per year regardless of the number of units they're doing and then obviously it's discounted 20 percent and so on as the numbers go beyond that so it's on a kind of sliding scale so generally the institution is paying that yes exactly yeah so the institution pays per user yeah So would you like me to jump onto the portal and show you how that all works? Or did anyone have any other questions? No, you might have some more as we, as we step through this. So I'll work through it with you. So can you all see the screen again now? Yeah. Okay, so you do everything. So the idea was when we were building this, I'll be the first to say this, that as an academic, we're not always um, particularly tech savvy. As far as I'd say particularly maybe in, in, in the accounting area. However, my colleagues would agree with me, so I'm not talking out of school here. So we wanted to um, create something that was going to be very easy and intuitive um, to set up. So essentially you do everything in this one screen. So there's essentially only three things you need to do. Um, add your content, invite your learners, and then you can select your, um, your badges as well. So in terms of creating the content, so you go to your content tab here, and then what we do is we usually align it with exactly what you're delivering week by week, but you might be, you know, do it in modules or you might like to do it in a different way. But we focus on the way I would do this. I set it up week by week to align with the unit outcome. And I know Maddie at Melbourne does it in the same way. And then let's say I want to guide the students to say that I'm going to focus on the introduction in that first week. What I want to do now is I want to build resources and topics, sorry, resources and questions around that particular topic. So I've got the option here, I can create um, questions and I've got the option to create multiple choice, select one, select all that apply, fill in the blank, true and false. And we also have then if you're, you know, using this in one of the sciences or engineering, engineering areas, you can also now, we've just recently added this function where you can enable formulas as well. So what you, um, what you can do is with the, um, just take that off for a moment. So you can type the question directly in, you can copy and paste from a Word document, or we've got a bulk upload CSV file if you had say hundreds of thousands of questions, and then you can drag and drop them into your various topics. You can also create hints and explanations if you want to kind of add that for the students. And you can upload images to both the question and the answers, which is, happens a lot in the sciences and engineering areas. You then just simply toggle the correct answer. So again, giving that student that immediate feedback. We set it up that there's a, a default setting of 30 seconds to answer a question and three attempts to get it right. You can give them five attempts. You can give them, you know, two minutes to answer it. That's entirely up to you when you set it up, but that's what our default settings are. So that's it in terms of adding a question. That's how you go about that. Then in terms of adding a resource, you've got the option to upload. You might have, you know, podcast, SoundCloud, YouTube, a PDF file, maybe a short case study, a PowerPoint, it could be as well. And you simply um, paste these in here, just save, and again, that's done. So that's it in terms of adding the content. Does anybody have any questions on, on that? No. And then once you've added it, then we clone it going forward for the next semester. So then you can you know, edit and amend and so on, delete, but you don't need to, to redo it. So with Quitch, I mentioned to you the notification. So the students said that one of the things they found annoying about the LMS was that when they'd go back into it, there was nothing new they said from the previous time they had been there and they were wasting their time and they had to pull down this information. So I thought, again, we could fix that by pushing them notifications to let, let them know when new material has been unlocked. So they, 
So what we do here, you can, with that topic, you can decide to send all of those questions and resources and the topic out one at a time. You might want to drip feed them over the five days and you can select what date and time you want it to go out. Or you might want to just do them, you know, all at once for that topic at just after a lecture maybe or at the end of the week or beginning of the week. So you send this, set the schedule up and then we just say set and forget. So you can set it up at the beginning of your semester and then you don't need to worry about it It'll automatically send a notification to their mobile device. So where, where is the, um, the, the content hosted, Gronya? Is it uh, just an Australian server or? Yes, Thomas, it's hosted in Sydney with AWS. Yeah. And again, yeah, we are often asked that question in terms of privacy. We're also GDPR compliant, but yes, all of the data is hosted in Sydney. And in terms of the information we collect on students or learners, we simply collect their first name, last name and email address and nothing else because that's all that's needed for this. So you have a, uh, a privacy policy? Yes, exactly. We can share all of that is on our website, but I can also share that those links with you. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just the question that always comes up when we're um, pointing people beyond the LMS. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so we've got all of that, and um, Thomas, is available for you. So that's how you create your content, and that's how you would then schedule it, and then that's done. In terms then of inviting your learners, you would do a, a bulk um, invite. And that's simply a CSV file, as I said. So you would just download our CSV file template that's here. First name, last name, email address, and then you just import it. As soon as you import, they'll get an email to their Swinburne or their you know, University of Melbourne email account saying, welcome to Accounting One in Quitch, and tells them to download. Then they register with that email address and they're up and running. If they're doing a second or third subject, then it's just automatically populated after they have enrolled in that first instance. If you wanted to just invite, yeah, say, you know, some educators to the portal one at a time rather than do the CSV file, you can do that here as well. You can just simply put in their email address, first and last name, and that gives them access. So you might have a team of people that you want to have access to the, the content and so on. Does that all make sense in terms of invitations? Mm -hmm. That's it. And then the badges. So these badges are pre-populated. So if you didn't want them to earn one, you would just simply turn that off. But otherwise, you don't really need to do anything there. These are set up that they get these badges along the journey, getting rewarded for, you know, getting a question correct, a winning streak, finishing a topic, and so on. And then finally is the announcements feature. And again, this go, announce goes out to a notification on their mobile device. So you can just a title. Again, you can decide what date and time you want to publish that message. You could also, if you wanted, rather than you know, type them a message, you might want to do a short YouTube clip. You can put the link in here and you can introduce, them, introduce yourself perhaps in that way at the beginning of the semester. And then in terms of the announcement groups, as I said, you can send something to your entire uh, global class or you can, we identify those who are at risk to send them a particular message. And then also for those who have not yet participated or have disengaged. So the next thing then I was, I was going to show you is the analytics from one of the classes say that I'm running. But before we do that, does anybody have any questions on this? Nope, all good? Okay, so just bear with me one moment. I'll just um, zip out and go to my class. Welcome, Gabrielle. Glad I could make it. I keep getting OutLab meetings on Fridays at this time. Ah, okay. <laughs> That's why Lisa's not here. Yeah, probably. Drowning. <laughs> right. Hello, Gabrielle. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, you're I'm very excited welcome. to hear nice the to later half of your session. <laughs> <laughs> I can always, we can always catch up another time if, you know, this time doesn't work, didn't, yep. you weren't able to hear everything. So, um, so again, so this is a, a unit that um, I've started a few weeks ago. So the idea was here that I wanted to be able to identify in real time what topics the students might be um, struggling with. So this is where I talked about performance of content and performance of um, individual students. So we can see here with starting a business, so they've completed 63% of that material available to them. Their accuracy level has been 83%. So the accuracy is based on, you know, 100% to get it right the first time, then obviously less the second time and so on. So it just gives me an idea what's going on. 
here. So I can see then starting a business, they did obviously introductory topic quite good. Um, not so good with um, my balance sheet, so maybe it was the way I presented it and so on. But the idea here is that I can see in real time where the areas of difficulty are. Does this make sense to everybody that we're breaking it down into, into those individual topics? That makes sense, yep. So that's with the content. And then the other thing I wanted to be able to do was identify and my students. So if I look at Christopher, so Christopher is the kind of student we're never really worried about. He, you know, completes the material. He does very well. I can see here how many points and badges he's earned. I can also actually then see every single question that Christopher has answered, the time he's answered it at. So this can give me a good idea when I should be sending out those notifications. What's the most popular time the students access? And it also tells me which questions he got correct and incorrect. I can download all of this data to a CSV file in these reports here. So if you want to do your own analysis around your taking it down to the question level, the student level, you can do that. So as I said, I'm not worried, ever too worried about Christopher. So the active students are those who have, I've invited them, they're up and running and they're happy and working away, but I want to filter for my other students that I'm worried about. So I filter here for those who are at risk. And I can see here that I've got three students who they're attempting the material, but they're not doing very well. So it allows me through that notification function, as I said, to reach out to them and have a, a conversation with them or run an additional workshop for them. And then also I've got, I'll also have a group I've discovered who they've went and downloaded the app and registered themselves, but they actually haven't done any work. So again, I want to be able to reach out to them and see, you know, what's happening, why they might be disengaged and so on. So and see if I can support them um, early in the, in the semester. If somebody leaves your course and you don't want them to have access to your material anymore, you can simply send them, move them in here to the, um, to the suspended area. And in a nutshell, that's it. Rainy, I had a quick question before we move on. Um, yeah. when, when you identify a student at risk, yeah. can the instructor set or define the threshold or the parameters of what constitutes at risk? Yeah, not right now, Chris. So we've set it at 50%, but that's a great question. And so what you'd like is kind of a sliding scale so you can decide you'd like to be able to determine what right. that is. Right, yeah. because it, it may, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think of this from the point of view of like introducing this to uh, some lecturers. And I would imagine that would be one of the questions they would ask as soon as yeah. that came up, but they say, well, but I might want a more sensitive risk level yes. uh, for various reasons, yep. obviously. Yeah. Totally and, and what about the students? Do they get feedback on you are currently at risk or you know, that, that can be a little bit um, negative? Uh, yeah, no, that would be Thomas. So no, they don't, they don't know that. So I send them, so obviously I, I know they're at risk. So I would send them an announcement and then I might invite them to an additional module and so on, just some you know, additional material. But absolutely, you need to phrase it in a, in a positive way and not say, hey, you're at risk. I see you're you know, looking like you might Yeah, think. then it becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling sort of uh, prophecy. prophecy. Yeah. Yes, I totally agree. So that's why. So they, they don't know that they fall into that category. Yeah. Yeah. Great question, though. Yeah. It's all about you know, positive reinforcement. It's not about you know, waving a stick at people. That's why I thought I want to be able to identify those so we can support them early. And we run some, you know, peer led groups and so on. So again, sometimes it's a matter of just actually reminding them that or, you know, letting them know these sessions are taking place because sometimes they might have missed the fact that that was announced in, in lectures and so on. And so then sometimes they'll start to turn up to the, those and things will turn around for them. But it's about, yeah, it's about um, contacting them early. So we give them that opportunity to, you know, do something about it. Because previously, I didn't know until, you know, they did that first kind of major piece of assessment, which is usually at least week six. And so I don't know about you guys might be a lot smarter than me, but if it's week six and I haven't done much or haven't done very well, then I'm unlikely to be able to turn things around. Whereas if I can, you know, grab someone in the first week or two, I have a much better chance of helping them succeed. Just what's, what's driving that. Anything, any other questions? I'll just stop sharing so I can see you a little better. So with the, 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 uh, the content, I'm just looking at the app, there's um, a whole lot of content there that, that it looks like I can access. Is that, um, 
Yes. You know, st stuff that's been made um, freely available by you know whoever's produced that or yeah, are these exactly. Just examples? So we have two. So we have two two things now. We released this content marketplace just um, uh, two weeks ago, actually. And so yeah. So the idea is that that content is free for a student. The idea is just to you know see the variety of content in there, and that's created usually by say it might be Access Education, which prepares content for Year Twelve students. Or it might be some of my, you know, colleagues in various universities who wanted to um, send something out to students. So there's two there's two areas, if you like. So if you want to develop something specifically for your course, you do that through this platform here. And then the other option is there's those free classes that students can access and just learn about any other topic them or anybody, not just a student, might be interested in. Right. Does so you can kind of use it as a open educational resource if you if you're willing to type of thing. Right. That's exactly right. Yep. Exactly. Um, so if it is a if it is basically an OER, do does the user still have to pay to access so, that? Yeah. So there's two different things. So at the moment all of this is free. So no the student doesn't pay. The user doesn't pay. So there's two different things. There's the marketplace which is accessible and available for everybody. And then there's tailored courses for your own group of students where the institution pays and gets a license. Does that make sense, Thomas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I guess the person creating the, uh, the content would have to be paying a, a license to start with to use the you know, creation tool platform. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, they would. Yes, yeah. So the idea there is down the track then to profile you know, people as they create their content in there, let's say if it's Maddie from Melbourne and so on, and there would be a profile from Maddie it? that he had created that content. Well, we started just two weeks ago, but it seems like there's a lot of interest in it actually. Yeah. Okay. So what some academics are doing, Thomas, is actually co-creating it with students. So they're doing like a QA on it. So the idea is that the students will, you know, create a lot of the content, but for example, you would then QA that. And then the idea down the track is then that we will profile you as the person who's, you know, managed and and um, manage that content, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But students are really um, very excited about co-creating the content. That seems to work very well, I have to say. They've created some fabulous classes for, for their own, in some cases, for their colleagues at the university as well, under the guidance of the academics. So especially there's some, um, I think it's anatomy and physiology, which a bit like accounting, I think has some quite high failure rates. Some of the students there have co-created it. This is for a Swinburne class. And the feedback is just, yeah, incredibly positive on it. The students apparently who used it got a 22% on average higher mark than those that didn't. But it's, it's a fabulously created course, I have to say. Yeah, so in that, those examples up where the students are co-creating, is that uh, a formative, um, you know, assessment or are they actually being assessed you know, no, summatively all, on, all on the stuff that they're co-creating? No, all, it's all formative. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, yeah, it's an academic who, she uh, came from the University of Adelaide and she had done quite a bit of that co-creating with students there. And um, then when she came across quit, she um, involved the students here and yeah, it's, it's going really well and it's now starting to take off in some of the other areas as well. And I think especially at the moment, it seems very appealing to students to get involved. They talked about feeling like they were part of a community where they had been feeling isolated and so on because they would get together actually in teams of two to three to actually create you know, content for the course. They would find really interesting resources. Yeah, they just did some fabulous work. So how, how does that work? Do the, do the students create a, a question or a resource and then you know, send that to the lecturer and the lecturer puts it through the system or is the lecturer yeah. giving them access to the... No, the, the lecturer is giving them access to, to, the, to the portal. So, and then the, what the academic does, they've been going through then and checking all of that content before they decide whether they're going to release it. So they do like a QA kind of process on it. Right. Yeah. And that's okay from your perspective, you know, that you've got multiple people logging in uh, to create that content. So that content is great. So that's owned by the university then because it's that, this particular academic who managed that and so on. 
So that's Swinburne's IP. So then it will be up to Swinburne if they decided they wanted to release that. We haven't released anything to the content marketplace via that at the moment. The only things we've, we've released is content providers that we have like Access Education or some people who have been employed by Quitch to actually create content for the marketplace. Does that make sense, Thomas? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't quite what I was asking, but um, yeah, okay. I mean, that makes okay. sense. But yeah. I, I guess it was just more about, you know, if you've got multiple people logging in via the one login, is that? Oh, no, it's not via the one login. They've got their own identified access. Okay, so their the, own unique the, access. The, uh, the, the lecturer or the admin person has the ability to create those, exactly. those logins for them. Okay. Exactly, yeah. So you always know who's in there at any time and what they've created. Yeah. So this is so this is students who say, for example, they've excelled in your unit this semester, and then they help create something for the students coming through in the in the next year. Okay. Any other questions from anyone else in our illustrious panel? Got a couple there, Neil and David. Um, thanks. <laughs> really, really interesting. Um, I'd just like to know how the gamification side of it differs from um, an LMS and whether that really makes a lot of difference to, from the student's perspective to keep them engaged and, and retained. Yeah, so from the student's perspective, there was a number of things there. Well, what they had said was that the LMS, so we use Canvas was the example, and they found it not as engaging the experience. So they, what they wanted was they wanted to be able to earn points, badges, identify you know, where they were compared to others on the leaderboard. They wanted to know what their activity level was, winning streaks there was some very particular um, items that they wanted that apparently they don't have well according to the students that we ran the focus groups with they don't have that same interactive enjoyable experience through the mobile app of the in this case it was it was canvas they were referring to so was, there, were very was there a difference around gender uh Gronje, around you know what what was uh motivating for students sorry what was that thomas i missed the first part what did, did, did you find there was a difference uh, in, in gender, you know, as to, you know, what, what girls found more motivating in the gamification side than guys did, etc.? Yes. So they actually, it was interesting in terms of the, the, when we ran the focus group, the guys were talking about, they love the idea of competing against one another. Okay. Whereas actually the girls said that they had no interest in competing against one another, but they felt they wanted to compete against themselves. So the guys said that if they started to perform well, for example, could they then identify themselves on the leaderboard because they wanted to kind of see how, show everyone how they were performing. The girls on the other hand, never wanted to be identified. <clears throat> and this is where we came up with the idea of actually, so one thing was people who weren't performing well didn't want to be identified, but every single girl in the focus groups that we did did not want to be identified. So we come up then with these Zuda names. So they were talking more about, so they wanted to see how they were doing compared to the class average, look at how they performed, for example, compared to the previous week and so on. They weren't so interested actually in the leaderboard and um, part of things. David, you had a question. Sorry, I put the mic on. Yeah, mine was also kind of around the the LMS space in the sense that, um, I mean, obviously if you've got a, a mobile platform like this and you've probably also got your LMS stuff, like, so has that been an issue of like, tr you know, trying to avoid doing everything twice or trying to coordinate your learning analytics? Is this something that's come up with, with your customers around, okay, so I've got my learning management system. If I do this, like, where do I divide things? Which, you know, what do I do with my analytics if they're in two places? Those kinds of questions. Yeah, no, David, that has um, has come up. And um, essentially, that idea really was around the analytics was, we want to be able to have the analytics around the performance and the student. Now, it is sometimes a bit of an issue if you've got to go to two different platforms. But the analytics you're getting through Quitch is quite different to the analytics you're getting through the LMS. And then there's the other side of it, whereas there's that personalized analytics going back to the students and you, of course, access to all of that as well. So what we're doing, what we haven't done yet is we don't have integrations with, say, Canvas or Moodle, but we will be able to do that soon because some people had, I think you're getting to the point where you want to have everything in that same place. So you can push that data from Quitch David up into the LMS and so on. Is that what you're, what you're getting at? So you have it all in one place? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, from our perspective, for example, um, our LMS doesn't have a mobile client. So, you know, it might be quite nice to have something mobile, but it's kind of a different thing. And, you know, there might be a sort of consideration about where, you know, what's the boundary between where this goes and where the LMS goes and how do they complement each other rather than getting in each other's way is probably yes. the higher level question. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah, no, that's an important point. And that's why in the sense, that's why we, we built this to like complement, if you like, the primary learning or complement the LMS. So that was the idea that, you know, directly after you'd finished your lecture and so on, you would push these questions out to the students so they could do in their own time. So it's very much about, it's, it's different to the content that you have in the LMS. It is about that consolidation reinforcement, just seeing, and we've built it around, you know, the idea of the forgetting curve and so on. So if I push it out directly after the lecture, there's much more chance because they're getting a notification on their mobile device that they're actually going to engage with that rather than, you know, just before they come to the lecture the following week and so on. So it kind of broke it, broke it out in that way, if that makes sense to you. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, most of the interaction I'm, I'm getting a sense is, is formative rather than summative. So you're not having to push back results into the LMS. No, that's exactly, it's all based on formative assessment is exactly right, Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just to keep people engaged and keep them on, on, on track. Yeah, I guess it's kind of... Um, then what value do you put on that, uh, you know, and is $7.50 per student, um, you know, worthy investment for that formative engagement? Um, you know, if, you, if you're looking at the nuts and bolts of it, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess it uh, is proof comes from, I suppose, the uh, cases that you've had that increase in engagement and, and filter through into increase in student uh, learning and marks. So we had, for example, in um, an introductory finance unit just this semester gone by, the academic reported um, 13% um, on average higher mark for those that were engaged with which versus those that didn't, which was, is very significant, I think. Hmm. Uh, do you, most people uh, use it with pretty large classes that it's difficult to have a kind of personal relationship with students. So you really need to have some sort of digital way of contacting them. Yeah, a lot of people do need use it in those large units, like those first year units, for example. But then it seems to have been just as successful in smaller units of like 25 with MBA students, postgraduate students and so on as well. Because again, it's, it's just about you're pushing that, so you're engaging with them outside of that um, classroom is the idea. So it has been as successful. I actually, like you, I thought it would be more successful in those large first year units, but it turns out those postgraduate units, people seem to get really engaged with it. And I think I gave the example there for Phil with in, over at UWA, where he had that 90% engagement. Then it was somebody at the University of Sydney had a 98% level of engagement with, the, I think it was a first year marketing unit actually. So it really, really does vary. And it really does also depend, of course, on the, on the academic. And how passionate I think they are and, and of course you know about promoting it and so on yeah thanks yeah. I think it's a great way also like in these in these times where uh, people are teaching and learning remotely to get another level of uh, feedback I suppose from the students and to understand their engagement um, so yeah I can so a lot of the frustrations I hear from academics is that they're when they're this quick shift to online learning, they're not really getting the feedback, they're not really understanding how, where the students are doing and how they're doing. So imagine this provides another level mm. of that. Yeah, it seems to be the two uh, main points of feedback from you know, surveying students. Uh, when when you know, their the, the learning's gone from face-to-face -to, -face to online, uh, one is the level of interaction online, which uh, apparently for most has is, is been pretty poor and uh, second that social interaction they're missing as well so you know if you can target those two areas uh, it's probably quite useful mm. and i think you're right i mean over and over again the students talk about you know being able to interact and the this idea of competing against your colleagues you know seeing how you are compared to the class average and so on just really seems to make a significant difference they talk about you know feeling part of a part of a group and so on 
So I think anything, especially these days, I think it's always been important, but I think especially these days, because they're all located remotely, if they can feel like, you know, they're having uh, that connection with colleagues and so on, I think is a, is a really important thing for them. And as well as that, they're getting their own individual feedback on how they're doing and so on, and what they need to focus on. Grania, has anyone used this for um, academic education, like, for example, like for tutor training or something like that, uh, actually applied it to in that, in that yeah, sense? The TFSA just um, came on board a few weeks ago, and that's actually one of the areas they, they haven't, I think, started using it for that yet, Paul, but it's actually something that they want to introduce, so professional development for teachers as well as, yeah, for new people coming in. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, good question. Hmm. And um, so some of the other um, universities and, and colleges have started using it just recently for um, well-being and um, health for students, well-being and resilience are two kind of topics they're using. So that's actually been going very well, I have to say. Yeah. And again, do, do you have any other, uh, any other uh, competitors in this market, um, Corny? Yeah, I well, I was saying Kahoot. I think is a is a competitor. So I bought, I actually used Kahoot in class with the students, and I found it actually really good. And they, you know, they were really engaged. They seemed to really enjoy the experience. But then when I did my, what I call my post mortem at the end of semester, it actually had made no difference whatsoever to their performance. So that's why it actually struck me that I needed to find something that could engage them outside of the classroom. So that was so I I consider therefore um, Kahoot um. A competitor and then there's another one called um, ed app ed app which comes out of um i think um no that's a us one i think and then there's one called Dr drillster which comes out of the netherlands so what they have all of them have some elements of quitch like some of them might have some might have a leaderboard or they might have a notification but none of them have all of those elements that we have together in one product and a lot of them don't don't have um, much around the analytics. They have some analytics, but not as much as the students here give us feedback about what they actually wanted. Right. You've, yeah. you've got the coolest name too, I think. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I just started watching uh, a new series by JK Rowling um, on TV, but she, I didn't, didn't know she was using a pseudonym, uh, Robert Galbraith, um, which, uh, yeah, yeah, I heard that. yeah, completely different. It's, it's a, it's a, um, you know, detective crime detective sort of uh, mm. series here. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, very and good. I suppose on the on that note, um, thank you very much, Gwanya. We we're pretty much um, coming up to our one hour, and, and obviously, uh, it's everyone's been very engaged and asking lots of questions, which is great. And um, thank you very much for showing us through Quitch, which I'd never heard of before. <laughs> good, you're um, very welcome. And um, yeah, so I think everybody has my details. Hopefully, and if you have any questions, please feel free to, um, to reach out. And I can share perhaps the publications on the peer-reviewed research and outcomes with you as well, if anyone is interested in reading those. Would you like me to share those with you? Yeah, I think they'd be really useful, particularly if, you know, as, as uh, justification for you know, looking at, at yes. a platform. Uh, if it's research and form, that, that certainly is a point of difference, yeah. Sure. I'll send those through. I think, um, Thomas, Four. I think you sent through everybody's um, email addresses so I can send those off. Yeah, I'll make sure you get them. I think um, some of them were just usernames, but um, okay. uh, try to get their email yeah. addresses too. And what I can do is I can add some of you, we've got this kind of fun general knowledge game. So I can, I'll, can add you to that as well so that you, you then receive an email and you'll see exactly what the process would be for your student to register if you were to, you know, go ahead with it. And if you wanted to create it for your own class and your own institution, then you'll have kind of the whole experience. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Great to meet everybody. Thanks so much.